Well, it's good to be with you again and to have an opportunity to spend time in, in God's Word and to share a message uh, with you. I would just like to echo Lisa's prayer and offer a prayer of my own at this time as well. Heavenly Father, I continue to ask that you would speak from your throne room today and that, Father, your spirit and your word would be heard in this place. All other distractions and obstacles be removed, Lord. May I be a vessel and may it be your spirit that blesses today in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, two weeks ago, I, I preached um, in kind of in connection to the events that we were doing uh, with the guest who's coming to dinner and uh, the, uh, the, the ladies thing that took place in the home about how our home is an extension of God's home. Our home is an extension of the church. Our home should be an extension of our faith and encouraged us to consider how that might apply to us in our own circumstance. In a way, I'm kind of dovetailing in with that today with talking about how our relationships are also an extension of our faith. Our relationship with our, our loved ones, our spouse, and, and our friends is also an extension of our faith and should be an extension of our, uh, of our relationship with God as well. Um, and so that's uh, just a little bit of a, a let you know kind of where I'm going. But I did want to mention just as a, an additional note to activities happening here. This next week, um, there is an event taking place on campus. It is the Spring Music Festival. So um, for those of you that have kids in band and music, they will probably be in the gym next Sabbath. And so a lot of our families and um, people will be over there in the gym, but we will be having services in our church as well. So you're welcome if your children are, are, are there. I know you're going to feel kind of torn between two things. That happens. That's life. We understand it. Um, but just so you know, we are having services here, um, and we will, uh, we will worship the Lord in this place uh, while the uh, music festival is also happening. Wanted to mention that. The title of my sermon is Loved. Isn't that nice? That's a good title, isn't it? It's, uh, it's, it's powerful. That alone is a sermon right there, Loved. Well, um, I do like to begin my messages with a little bit of an interaction with young people. Um, February is not known for having as many celebrations and festivals. Where's Lukey and Toby? I want to welcome uh, Toby's friend Lukey here from Vancouver, Washington. We're glad he is able to visit with us, and he is going to help with our microphone so the young people can participate. When I was growing up in school, February was like a desert of holidays because, you know, leading up to Christmas, you had other things. You had Thanksgiving. Uh, you had Halloween, you had Labor Day, you had these breaks, and then you had the Christmas break. But coming back from, uh, from New Year's break, it seemed like it took forever to get to spring break because there were not a lot of uh, uh, federal holidays and things. But February actually does have some special holidays in them, and I just want to see how many of the young people know what they are. There's one coming up on Monday, and that's the first one. Andre, what one's that? Do I just like say all of them? No, no. You say the first one. President's Day. Okay. President's Day is correct. Do you know when I was growing up, there was no President's Day? When I was growing up, we celebrated Washington's birthday, which was in January sometime, and then Lincoln's birthday, which was February 12. I don't know why I remember that one. Um, so President's Day, um, and still it's, it's uh, 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 confusing to me what the federal status of President's Day is. Um, I even did a little bit of research on it. But when I was growing up, there was no President's Day. We had Washington's uh, birthday. We had uh, Lincoln's birthday. But nowadays, there's President's Day. There's also a particular kind of history that we celebrate in February. What kind is that? All right. We're going we're gonna to see. I know. I see your hands. Dylan? Black History Month. Black History Month. I know you guys wanted to do that. Lissel, why don't you tell me who this is that I put up there to represent black history? Would you identify that gentleman for me? And then we will know how wonderfully intelligent you are. I heard someone say it. Go ahead and say it, Lissell. Frederick, Frederick Douglass. The most photographed individual by far in the 19th century is Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, they used his photograph. He encouraged it. The abolition movement encouraged it. He, be he believed and it was believed that his, uh, his appearance and his look spoke volumes to the movement of freedom. Um, I am an extremely big fan of uh, Frederick Douglass. I've read all of his autobiographies, all three of them. Um, I believe he's the most important American ever born. And I bet if we got into an argument about it, I could convince you. Um, uh, Prove it. Yeah, we will. We will later. Just listen to me. I'm your father. All right. 
So I, I don't want to get into that, but Black History Month is a, uh, is a part of February now, and, and there's a history to that. Now, there's another one that starts with a G, um, and we haven't gone back here yet. So Abel? Groundhog's Day. Groundhog's Day. I remember as an elementary school student, this is the closest thing to a holiday we had in February when I was growing up, at least one that mattered to me, because we would go to the library and we would do the whole um, uh, building of a, of a groundhog thing and we would cut it out of paper mache and whatever. Um, by the way, if I remember right, he, uh, he saw a shadow, didn't he? So it means in early spring, didn't he? Anyone follow Punxsutawney Phil? Come on now. I think he saw a shadow. Yeah, so yeah, he saw a shadow. So that means early spring, which here in Phoenix just means summer comes faster. Anyway. <laughs> All right, and I know, by the way, did you know there are 108 actual uh, uh, celebrations and recognized special dates in February? You know, there's a special day for a, a waffle day, National Waffle Day, National Listen to the Radio Day, you know, and all that kind of stuff. There's 108 of them in February, including because of the way Easter falls, Ash Wednesday and Fat Tuesday are also in February, which is very rare. So what's the last one that starts with a V? All right, Benjamin. Valentine's Day. Oh, they did a good job, didn't they? So I'm sorry I couldn't get all of the young people involved, but that, those were the ones I wanted to talk about today. How many of you have seen these little candy hearts? They're kind of, they're kind of a, a staple of Valentine's Day. They were all the way back when I went to school. Um, back when I went to school, um, you had to give gifts to everyone in class. Do you remember that? You couldn't just give a gift to one person. It was a rule that if you were going to give to one, you had to give. Is that still Mrs. Campos uh, kind of the thing? So my mom would go and buy me a box of these little candy hearts and she'd say, David, this is your gift. Uh, she, she called me David, but, which is why I prefer Dave, by the way. Only mom calls me David, just so you know. All right. So um, she would buy these things of hearts and you know what I would do? I would go through those hearts and I would make sure I didn't give a girl any of the ones that said things like, be mine and I love you and stuff like that. I, would, I didn't want to get a girl to give that because we wouldn't want that to you know, send the wrong message. When you're 10 or 11, that really matters. But. Uh, that was it for the quiz, boys. I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear. You can just set the mics down or, or whatever. So this last one here is rhetorical for you. What book of the Bible... You know, we just, uh, remember, we just had Valentine's Day this week, right? Remember that? February 14th. What book of the Bible goes with Valentine's Day? I'm in my 24th year of ministry. I have only preached out of this book one other time. And I, I looked it up. I had to go into my records. It was in 2010. 2010 is the only other time I have ever preached out of this book. But as I was preparing and praying about what to preach about today, the Lord directed me here, Jaylene. What book of the Bible goes with Valentine's Day? I bet it's one that you don't read very often. I bet it's one that you're not super familiar with. But I bet after today, you'll be more interested in it. It's called the Song of Solomon. How many of you got it? Yeah? Song of Solomon. It's a unique, every book in the Bible has its own unique characteristics, but Song of Solomon really is quite unique within the scriptures. And I want to tell, I want to talk to you a little bit about this book of the Bible. I want to, I want to get into some of the history and background with this just very, very quickly. We're not going to go too far in depth. Song of Solomon. It obviously is a love story. It is highly poetic, which is why some people don't, if you don't enjoy poetry, it's, it's a little harder to get into Song of Solomon. It's highly poetic and imaginative. It's highly romantic. And it's highly sensual. Highly sensual. To the point that when the rabbis were debating which books of the Bible belonged in the canon, and I don't know if this story is apocryphal or, or true or not. You know, you got to be careful what your uh, college teachers tell you, you know. Um, but there's a story that as the rabbis were debating the books of the canon, the Old Testament canon, when it came to Song of Solomon, there was, a there was a very significant debate about whether or not it belonged within the oracles of the Old Testament. 
And there was the camp that said no, and there was the camp that said yes. And as they began to uh, negotiate, navigate, finally the conservative camp said, well, we will allow it, we will endorse it, we will allow Song of Solomon to be in the canon of the Bible, but here's the caveat, you can only interpret it as an allegory. For anyone who interprets the book literally has no place in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I want you to understand something. The Jewish culture is hot. You may not know this. The Jewish culture is highly comfortable with sensuality, much more comfortable than the European Victorian culture that I come from. The Jewish culture, very comfortable with sensuality. So if the Jews themselves struggled with the boundaries of sensuality in the book of Sol Song of Solomon, you know that it is very, very erotic. And it is. Now, by the way, just, just, I don't know if you can see it on the screen here. I, I put it up here. You see the beginning of the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for thy love is better than wine. Thank you. I couldn't quite see it in the bin. But um, now, um, children, shield your eyes for a moment. Look right here. A bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me. He shall all, lie all night between my breasts. And all the married men said, Amen. <laughs> Song of Solomon. And that's just the beginning. By the way, if your husband or your boyfriend has recently been to a men's retreat, and they come back a little more amorous than they were before, and you're wondering, what did they study at this men's retreat? Just take their Bible, okay? Get your man's Bible, and just set it down like this. And if it naturally flops open to Song of Solomon, you know that they've been studying Song of Solomon. How do we deal with this? Song of Solomon. It's, it's a book by, written by Solomon. There are three voices in the entire book. Eight short chapters, 117 verses. There's only three voices. There's the voice of Solomon speaking to his beloved. There's the voice of the bride. We'll talk about her in a second. And then there's a chorus. There, in, in, in literature and poetry, there's always observers. You know, behold, my love is like a gazelle dancing through the forest and the leaves of the blossoms of the, you know, it's, it's all this stuff, right? And then there's a chorus. Yes, their love is sweeter than wine. Yes. But those are the only three voices. You have the voice of the king, Solomon. You have the voice of the bride, who's known as the Shulamite. And then you have the observing chorus. And you'll see them throughout the text. Now, Solomon... Well, let me talk about the Shulamite for a second here. We don't know who she was, okay? We don't know who she was. Um, to this day, there are debates and arguments about which wife it was that Solomon married and what he wrote this book to. Now, when you think about this for a second, isn't Solomon an interesting person for God to choose to write the most romantic book that is included in Scripture? What is Solomon known for? Well, his wisdom, right? He was known for his wisdom, but he was also known for his stupidity, right? What is he known for? How many ladies were in his life? Half a dozen? Twenty-five? A thousand between wives and concubines. And the Bible also talks about additional maidens. Now, uh, again, not all of this is, is uh, a sensual romantic relationships. A lot of it, he's the king, our political you know, uh, 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 treaties with nations where he would take a wife of a neighboring nation to ensure peace and stuff like that. But he's an interesting choice, isn't he? For God to use to write the song of songs, the greatest song, the greatest love poetry ever written to come from Solomon. Um, but he writes it to um, this Shulamite woman. And again, we don't know who she was. What we do know, some people say, well, it must have been his first love, right? Uh-uh. He mentions in the book he already has 140 wives at this point. He tells us right in the book. He already has 140 wives. 60 plus 80 is 140, right? 80 queens and 60 maidens is mentioned. Okay? So he already has these other political and other relationships, and yet he sings this song and writes this poetry to the Shulamite. Now, people wonder, is Shulamite kind of like Shalom, the woman of peace, Shalomite? Is it Jerusalemite? Um, what is interesting is what we do know about her is she was not of the nobility. She would be considered a peasant girl who did not feel comfortable in the court, who did not feel comfortable or welcome, or she did not feel like she belonged in the palace with the king. So we know that about her. 
Solomon, who writes this book, tells us uh, just a few things about her. But why Solomon? Notice some things that Solomon tells us about some of his relationships and choices. Going into some of the other works of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, all that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased. Now, he's not just talking about eating ice cream, you know, and, and going on vacations here when he talks about all that my eyes uh, saw and every pleasure I did not refuse myself to. He's talking about sensuality, okay? He's saying, I experienced everything. I did not refuse myself anything. But notice what he says later in Ecclesiastes. And I discovered <laughs> all my eyes desired. I did not withhold from me. But what I discovered more bitter than death was the woman whose heart is snares and whose nets are chains. No amens to this, please. No, we don't do that here. One who is pleasing to God will escape from her, but the sinner will be captured by her. Solomon is aware of the opposite side of romance. He is aware of the depths of the wrong way of doing love and of doing relationships, which is why I think God also used him to extol the right way. Notice what he says in the Proverbs. There's lots of these. We're not going to go through them all. A foolish son is destruction to his father, and the contentions of a wife are a constant dripping. Interesting way of saying it, isn't it? Drip, drip. You know, I think in our language today, we would call that a nag. A nag. He goes on to say, it's better to live in the corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. I think he had a few contentious women in his life. And so he writes for all time to be remembered in the sacred scripture be careful what you do with your relationships, because no matter how wise you are, no matter how right you think you are, if you make a mistake, if it's not ordained by God, you're going to be in trouble. It's better to live in the corner of a roof than to share a house with a contentious woman. It's better to live in a desert land with, than to live with a contentious and vexing woman. You think with all the power that he had, with all the wisdom that he had, that he could navigate relationships better. Nope. He says it's better to live in the desert than if you have gotten connected with someone that does not share your value and your love. And then I love this, this part uh, in Proverbs 25. It is the same verse as in Proverbs 21. It's better to live in the corner of a house than to be with a contentious woman. And I imagine the scribe, as, as Solomon was reciting these Proverbs and the scribe was writing them down, as he gave the last one there in Proverbs 25, the scribe probably said, now wait, wait a minute, Solomon, you've already given us this proverb. And Solomon said, well, they need to hear it again. Put it in. It needs to be repeated. Be careful. It's better to live in the corner of a house than to share with a contentious woman. These... He understood the bad side. He had made so many mistakes. And by the way, if not Solomon, who would have been better? Would David have been a better example to write the best love song ever? Did David have some problems with it? How about Jacob? We should go to Jacob, right? Jacob did the right thing when it came to the lady. No, Abraham. Abraham was really well. And no. How about Moses? Surely Moses. But did Moses? Oh, man. Samson. Samson would be the one we turned to. Show me a man in the Bible that did things always right towards women. Okay? And I'm not trying to justify it. I'm not trying to say that that makes it okay. But God chose Solomon despite the fact that Solomon had so many challenges. He used him as a vessel to write Song of Solomon. And he was able to work through uh, these problems. So Solomon knew some good things too. An excellent, virtuous wife is like a crown of her husband. The crown symbolizing authority, symbolizing wealth, symbolizing power. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but if she shames him, it's like rottenness in the bones. House and wealth are an inheritance but fathers from fathers, but a prudent wife, that comes from the Lord. Fathers can give their sons an inheritance and houses and wealth, but only the Lord can give an understanding wife. He did know the blessings also and the virtues of having good relationships. So that is a little bit about Solomon and his relationships. Now, it's interesting that it's the song of Solomon. The song of Solomon. Often when we think of music in the Bible, 
We, re- we, we remember the great stories like when Paul and Silas sang in prison and the, the earthquake came and set them free. We remember that Jesus sang a hymn on his way to Gethsemane. We remember, you know, uh, the, the, the Psalms are songs and, and, and within those are, are wonderful teachings. And we're studying the Psalms in our Sabbath school. And many of us in our adult Sabbath school lessons are studying the Psalms. But really, if you look at it from a broader context, God uses song and music in virtually every context of anything he does significantly in the Bible. And I put a few examples here. First, this, the story of when Adam meets Eve. If you look in your Bibles, and if you have a Bible, this is in, in Genesis chapter 2, if you look, it's the only statement that Adam makes in Genesis chapter 2. The only time he speaks is when he meets Eve. And when he meets Eve, the way the Hebrew is written, the way the Hebrew is pointed, it's very clear that the Jews tell us that Adam sang when he met Eve. This is now bone of my bone. This is now flesh of my flesh. For she has been taken out of man and she shall be called woman. That wasn't just a wooden statement that he made. He didn't just say, well, this, is, this looks nice. This, I, I like what you've done here, Lord. The model looks, uh, looks like a good model. I think we can work with that. This is bone of my bone. No, 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 no. When Adam met Eve, his heart was filled with excitement. His heart was filled with racing. And by the way, you can read in Song of Solomon allusions to Adam and Eve. You can read about the experiences of Adam and Eve in their first romantic engagement in Song of Solomon. It's referenced. Adam sang when he met Eve. Now, guys, don't don't act like you don't understand this. Didn't your heart sing just a little bit when you met your wife? Oh, my Some of you are in trouble. Are you afraid to admit it? Didn't your heart flutter uh, when when you met her? Didn't there spring up in you some sort of of higher uh, uh, romance that inspired song? We could go all day on this. We can't take all the time. The creation of the world. Now, we know God spoke the world into existence, right? It tells us that clearly in Genesis. But throughout the narrative of Scripture, you have allusions to the fact that it was more than just speech, that when God spoke the world into existence, it was in the context of song. Did you know that? That God, either there was singing of the heavenly angels, or God himself, as he spoke the world into existence, did it in the context of singing. Either the singing was happening as he spoke, or the very words that he spoke were done so with song. And by the way, this goes right through a lot of the literature that describes the creation of the world, and and we can go into that to a greater... The Exodus, when God redeemed his people, what did they do when they crossed the Red Sea? They sang, so redemption itself is a song. Prophecy and the process of prophesying throughout the Bible, the vast majority of prophecy that we read in the Bible is given to us... to us in the context of music. The Psalms themselves, which are songs, are not just words of wisdom. They are prophecies given to us in music. Worship, we know how central, uh, uh, central music was to the worship of God. So the fact that Solomon would write the greatest love poetry and put it in the context of a song is just consistent with the way God uses music throughout the entire biblical narrative. Now, my wife and I, we love music. We are not musical in that we have technical uh, abilities when it comes to that, but we, we love music, and my wife has helped expand my appreciation of music, um, and, and we are quite eclectic in our music appreciation, meaning we like music from a lot of genres. Now, I want to be careful here. Just because I mention a genre of music I like does not mean that every artist and every lyric and every lifestyle associated with that music I'm endorsing. But there's, a, there's a, a, a level of appreciation for a variety of music um, that we, we enjoy. Now, whenever you're in our home, whenever we're in the car, whenever we're doing anything, we almost always have music playing, music in the background. We've got like 50 Pandora stations that we can tie into. As a child of the 80s and 90s, I grew up with the big hair and glam bands, punk, progressive, urban pop, and new wave, all were part of my growing up experience. And there was an element of each of those that I grew to appreciate. The 90s introduced grunge and alternative, and uh, so I got to be familiar with those. But in the mid-90s, a new sound took root in American culture. It had been around for years, but was largely unknown in the U.S. until an American band called the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones from Boston released their single, The Impression That I Get. It's called Ska, S-K-A. 
Have you ever heard of ska? Ska kind of erupted from then and it has become a, a major part of, of, of our culture. It originates from Jamaica. It's kind of the opposite of reggae. Reggae is kind of a downbeat, rhythm and blues, slow and flow um, um, style music, where ska is an upbeat, up strumming. If you play guitar, strum up the entire time you're playing ska. It's only up strumming. It's fast paced. It's big brass. It's, uh, it's uh, loud. And I have found of all the music genres that I like, I don't like ska. I like church music and hymns. I like the Gaithers and modern worship. I like oldies and country, bluegrass and honky-tonk, folk music, soft rock, swing, jazz, American bandstand. But I don't like ska. I like southern gospel, soul train, funk, disco, R&B, hip-hop, K-pop, sock hop, bubble pop, and doo-wop. But I don't like ska. I like the crooners, the criers, the dreamers, the whiners. I like classical and Broadway, operas and musicals. I like Celtic music, Latin, reggae, Hawaiian, flamenco. But I don't like ska. I even like elevator music. <laughs> but you want to know who loves ska? My wife. And you, do you know there's a principle? Whenever you're trying to make someone like your music, if they don't like it at first, you just turn it up, right? Do you like this? Uh, I don't know. Well, let me make it louder. If it gets loud enough, then you'll like it, right? Oh, my goodness. Through our romantic uh, beginnings and enjoying music together, I endured a lot of ska despite how much we have in common of liking all genres of music except that, for some reason, you'll find ska playing in our house more often than I would like. But I love her. And I love the fact that we love music together. And even when we don't always agree, we have found a way to still have our song together. The message of the Song of Solomon is one of deep romantic connectivity. It's about the gift and beauty of companionship and love. It's about the power of allurement. And it recognizes the outstanding uh, nature of how sensuality affects the human being. As a matter of fact, the only time the name of the Lord is found in Song of Solomon, which, by the way, which was one of the reasons why the rabbis balked at Song of Solomon. They felt like in order for a, a book of the Bible to be in the canon, it had to include the name of the Lord, which is why Esther barely snuck in. The name of the Lord is not found in Esther once. And yet it was still, it was still, it was in the Bible of Jesus, and we love it. We know that it is part of the canon. Song of Solomon only mentions the name of the Lord once, and it identifies the passion of love as the flame of Yahweh. I want to read it actually for you. It's it toward the end, Song of Solomon chapter 8. I had it and I lost it. Let me pull it back up here. It's about the power of allurement. Poor, uh, Song of Solomon 8 verse 6. Put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as severe as Sheol. Its flashes are flashes of fire. The very flame of the Lord. The very flame of God. What is the flame of God? The Shekinah glory of God. The burning, consuming power of God. This is how the passionate, romantic love between a man and a woman is described. Many waters cannot quench it. Rivers will not overflow it. If a man were to give all the riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. So the power of allurement is part of the message of Song of Solomon. But it's also about the passion of God's love for us. And that's where, in the last few minutes, as I come now down to the main topic that I want to draw your attention, the passion if man's and woman's passion for each other are of such great level, that is a way of understanding that God has an equal passion for us. Now, I want you to notice just a few verses from Song of Solomon, 
just chapter 2, the first four verses. I put them on the screen for you. You might recognize some of them. I am the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys. Like a lily among the thorns, so is my darling among the maidens. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so my beloved is among the young men. In his shade I took great delight, and I sat down, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. It's very beautiful, very poetic, and uh, uh, you know, built up in this imaginary you know, description of passionate love. But then there's the verse that probably most of us remember to some degree. He has brought me to his banquet hall. And his banner over me is love. Any of you grow up singing that church song? Brought me to his banqueting table. And his banner over me is love. I am my beloved and he is mine. His banner over me is love. It comes from Song of Solomon. Now I want you just to pause. I want to pause here. This is the main crux of the story and of the message today. He has brought me into... This is a description. This is the bride speaking to what the groom has done. And she says, he has brought me. She who was not of the nobility, she who had no right nor claim to being in the palace and to be among the nobility, she says, but he has brought me. He has invited me. He has taken me from where I don't, uh, from where I'm comfortable. And he's brought me to where I don't belong. He has brought me to his banqueting table. The groom, the king has brought me out of the wilderness and he's brought me into his presence, into the banqueting table among his family and his relatives. Very similar to what his father, what David did with Mephibosheth, if you remember the story. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, who was outside of, of, uh, of the kingdom and, and had been forgotten and neglected and David redeems. I, I talked about Mephibosheth when I did my series on forgiveness, how David redeemed Mephibosheth and he brings him back to the king's table to show him that he has now been adopted as his son. Very similar language. He's brought me into his banquet hall. He has introduced me. He's brought me and he's established me as one of his that belongs to him. It's also very similar to the shepherd psalm in Psalm 23, where at the end of the psalm, David says, he has prepared a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And what David is saying, before the enemy attacks, if the enemy wants to know who my God is, God has established intimacy with me. He has sat down in the presence of my enemies, and he has shown that he is on my side and that we have intimacy together. So enemies, beware. If you attack me, you are attacking the one who is intimate with God. This is a similar saying, but only it's not amongst the enemies of God, but among the most intimate friends of God. He says he has brought us in and, and sat us down with him in the banquet hall. He is eating with us. He is bringing us. Very similar, again, to Revelation where it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him. This intimacy that is described here in Song of Solomon. But then this next phrase is, is one that we should not gloss over, is one that we should not race by or, or, or try to misunderstand. He has set his banner over us and declared us loved. Not only does he bring us into his banquet hall, not only does he draw us into his personal space of intimacy, but then he sets a standard above us. He sets a sign. He sets a note. He puts up a, a, an imagery and a picture saying, of all people, I want you to understand that this is the one that I love. He has set his banner over me in any part of the ancient culture, if you were part of a city or if you were part of a traveling group, you carried a banner to identify who you were. Oh, that's the children of Israel. That, that, those are the people that are traveling through the land and they worship El Shaddai. We see their banner. They worship the lion of the tribe of Judah. We see their banner. Okay, if you conquered a city, you would take down their banner and you would put up your banner as a sign of victory. We have had, we've won this city and we're putting up the banner of our God. So here, when, when Solomon says that, that he brings the bride in and he welcomes her in, and then he puts a banner over her as a way of declaring amongst everyone who's watching, everyone who's there, this is my beloved. I have welcomed them in, and this person above all people is love. Now, friends, you are that bride. You are the one that God has set his banner above you so that all people would know you are loved. That is the gospel. That's the greatest message that could ever be bestowed upon humankind, to know you are loved. 
That is the message that we need. That is the message that sin tries to destroy and tell you you're not loved. You are worthless. You are without. You are outside. You are not welcome. And God comes in and he sets his banner over us to say, no, that's not the story at all. You are loved. You are loved. If you don't feel loved, you say, I don't feel loved. You are loved. You don't feel worthy of love? You are loved. He has set his banner over you. You feel like, I don't deserve love. You are loved. I'm alone. I don't have anyone in this world. You are loved. I've never been married. I've been divorced. I'm single. I'm in an unhappy marriage. You are loved. Let it never be taken away from you. Let it never be removed from your memory and from your mind. No matter where you are in your station in life, He has set a banner over you. He has declared you as His own. He has welcomed you into His banqueting table. And He has said, you are loved. I've made mistakes. You are loved. Solomon knew all about mistakes. But you are loved. That is the message. This is the gospel at the heart of this beautiful love story. You are loved. His banner over you is loved. How many of you are thankful that you know that you are loved? Boy, that message needs to be heard in this world today. We're not hearing that. When you turn on the news, is that what you're hearing? In your workplace, in the debates, in sports? I love competition. But in the context of our world, we are not getting this message enough. And we need to be reminded of it over and over. To possess true godliness means to love one another, to help one another, to make apparent the religion of Jesus in our lives. When the Lord's people are filled with meekness and tenderness for one another, they will realize that His banner over them is love. His fruit will be sweet to their taste. I like this part now. Heaven will begin on earth. Some people say, I just, I can't wait for heaven, right? I, I want heaven today. You want heaven today? I think I've lost you. It's 12, 22. Have I lost you? Do you want heaven to come today? Are you ready to go home? And we all want that and we desire it. But the Lord instructs us that when we really experience and understand the passion of his love, heaven begins now. We can experience heaven now. Heaven begins on earth. They will make a heaven below in which to prepare for heaven above. Are you thankful that you're loved? God wants to use our relationships to illustrate His passion for us. And we can study and read the other passages and the rest of the Song of Solomon. It can be a great blessing to our, our, our marriages and to our relationships. But we should always remember that the most important message is God's relationship with us. It's passionate. It's passionate. And His banner over us is love. Let's pray together. God in heaven, I know it's a simplistic sentiment and message, but sometimes, Father, we don't need complex. We need simple. And Father, I pray that every heart within the sound of my voice would hear the message and apply it to their lives that they are passionately loved. Not from a distance, not in a sanitized way, but in a deep relational way way God is passionate about declaring his love for us. He is passionate about coming back and reestablishing the intimacy that we have lost because of sin. But Lord, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and through the power of faith, we know that as we open our hearts to you, we can experience that love even now. And we can share that love. And we should share that love. And we must share that love even now. If we are loved, so also should we love others. Change our heart, Lord. Make us into that image. Impress that truth upon our hearts that you have set your banner over us. And on that banner is the word, 
love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for worshiping with us. We hope that you have a great week, great rest of your Sabbath. Hopefully we'll see you again soon. God bless.